civil engineering uh, is organizing sixth webinar in this uh, month uh, may so today's webinar is uh, on non destructive evaluation of the pavement by an eminent uh, professor dr arvind swami associate professor iit delhi so i welcome you uh, sir ha ah, sir hearty welcome to you sir yeah, thank you sir i also welcome our uh, beloved principal uh, dr sidramappa it uh, to this webinar and uh, i welcome uh, many of the faculty members from uh, various organizations also have joined so uh, i welcome all the faculty members of uh, the engineering colleges and also the students of uh, so i welcome all the faculty members and students uh, to this webinar so once again i welcome one and all to this webinar so now over to professor deepak yes sir yes sir am i audible sir yeah right yeah uh, a warm good evening to one and all present over here uh, myself uh, professor deepak patel working as an assistant professor in the department of civil engineering at uh, sgbit badgaon i am also moderate for today's uh, webinar it gives me honor to introduce uh, today's speaker dr arvind krishna swami dr arvind krishna swami is working as a associate professor at iit delhi he received the phd degree in civil engineering from university of new hampshire usa and mtech degree from indian institute of technology kanpur india he did his bachelor's degree in civil engineering from national institute of engineering mysore india during his industrial and research career spanning 17 years he has worked on several projects funded by several agencies like national science foundation usa new hampshire department of transportation asian development bank department of science and technology he has been uh, serving as subject expert at various organizations and committees constituted by government of india including bureau of indian standards indian road congress over past 8.5 years as a faculty years, as a faculty member at iit delhi he has guided two phd theses 25 mtech theses 42 btech projects in various areas including asphaltic materials pavement design and transportation engineering as a part of academic activities he has published uh, over 60 articles in reputed international journals and conferences he has provided a professional opinion to various government and private undertakings in the areas of pavement design pavement forensic analysis and recycling materials his current research interests include pavement engineering modeling behavior of asphaltic materials damage analysis using continuum damage approach rheology of bitumen and recycling of pavement materials we are very much fortunate enough to have dr arvind krishna swami as a speaker for this webinar i once again welcome you sir yeah, thank you uh, bef yeah before i hand over the session to dr arvind sir i would like to announce few of the etiquettes of this webinar i request all the participant to please mute your audio do not annotate in between the session as it will disturb the speaker question and answer session will be at the end of the session and feedback link will be shared at the end of the session now we would like to hand over the session to sir sir you can go ahead yeah um, am i audible yes sir yes sir you are audible sir okay uh, good evening everybody uh, as the slide shows like uh, the topic is on non destructive evaluation of flexible pavement uh, to start with uh, uh if you look at like indian transportation infrastructure we all know uh the the highway infrastructure plays a important role in transportation of goods people across the country so now uh, if you look at overall country like way like uh, if you broadly look at uh, the type of surface what we have that's either it's going to be cement concrete or bituminous material that's the asphalt uh here like i would be using term bitumen and asphalt interchangeably uh primarily uh, with asian context like we use term bitumen versus the other uh, western part of world like they use term asphalt uh so like if i use bitumen or asphalt like it pretty much refers to same uh, so now like if you look at indian context like uh, majority of our roads are made with bituminous material so which means like uh, uh, we have like sufficient expertise and then like what i know how in back end uh primarily like uh, we are using bitumen extensively because uh the initial construction cost is on lower side as well as maintenance uh we do require some amount of money on routine basis 
as compared to cement concrete pavement basically like, uh, the initial cost of cement concrete pavement it's on higher side like we pretty much know it however where like cement concrete pavement they don't require much maintenance but the major challenge would be like well, like uh, during construction like if you don't have proper quality control we do end up with lot of issues down the line and then like the maintenance of cement concrete road is going to be very tough task as compared to bituminous material it's easy enough where like we see a photo like all we need to do is bring some uh, bituminous material put it and then uh, patch it that's it so now uh, that's one of the reason like where like we do see bituminous material pavement uh, across the country uh, which is popular now if you look at how exactly the load that's going to be transmitted on the road uh, pretty much like where like we would have like layered structure where like we might have like two or three layers all the way until six seven layers of material where at, at the top like we would have the asphaltic material or uh, say bituminous concrete uh, usually followed by uh, dense bituminous macadam and then below it like we have wet mix macadam and below it uh, usually granular subbase and then the subgrade that's the existing soil uh, uh, inside condition so now what would happen like if i have a vehicle be it a lorry or a uh, bus whatever the load from the vehicle that's going to be transmitted to the axle and now the load through axle is that's going to be transferred to the individual wheels which in turn uh, is going to be transferred to the surface layer through the area of uh, wherever like the area of contact right so now whatever load that's going to be uh, transmitted to the topmost layer that's going to be transmitted to underlying layers through uh, aggregate to aggregate contact so uh, which what we do refer to as particle to particle contact and then that's how like where the load is going to be distributed over the uh, overall pavement structure right so now having said that like we say if we take a case where i have a pavement like where it, uh, we construct today and just monitor its performance over a period of time where say like once i construct it like where i would see like the surface is going to be very smooth and people would enjoy going on it right uh, so now over a period of time what would happen or uh, due to whatever load like that's going to be transmitted from the vehicle to the uh, underlying layers we do see some changes in the uh, microstructure of the uh, individual layers which in turn is going to lead to some deterioration of the pavement in this sense, like, well, like i might have uh, some cracks on surface some reorientation of aggregate some compaction so on going on in the underlying layers which in turn is going to reduce the quality of the pavement in this like, like what are the riding quality like i would have in on day one that's like, like we construct a pavement today and then leave it for traffic that's not going to be the, there after say two or three years or ten years so on so now what would happen like we say the curve like which is shown in the red line this is going to be the trajectory of the pavement where say like uh, the uh, surface would take from uh, where say like initially i would have the excellent condition which will go to really poor condition eventually like we, we do assume it to be have failed over a period of time this might take 10 years 20 years depending on like how we are going to construct the pavement and then the quality control issues are associated and how we are going to design it so on but on the other hand like if you see like basically like if i take up some maintenance activity in between right and then make it good enough so that like we like i get some uh, better quality road which means like at this particular point like basically like, uh, i see a drop and then i put uh, some uh, i intervene and then like have some overlay or some any other maintenance activity so which in turn is going to increase the uh, condition of the pavement which will go uh, from here to here and then like once i allow the traffic again that the uh, pavement is going to deteriorate here so now if i go on repeating this exercise then i can have the quality of the pavement at really good condition for really long time and now essentially this is the fundamental uh, diagram what we do we use in case of payment management in this like if i'm going with say strategy basic like, i just don't do uh, any maintenance activity and just leave it for payment to fail and then take up a new payment construction that's uh, indicated by this red curve i need to invest a lot of money when compared to ways like i intervene at uh, regular intervals pick a do some maintenance activity and so that like i have a uh, payment at reasonable qual uh, quality beat in terms of rideability or whatever right so that's uh with that like, well, like what we are looking is like 
how do i know at what point like i need to intervene and make take up some maintenance activity right so that's essentially the whole purpose about this particular presentation or uh, that's the structural health monitoring of payment using non destructive evaluation um with that if i move further in this like uh, if we are looking at say like a uh, payment truck structure and then like once i have the vehicle load moving on it i would expect some compressive stress and tensile stress in uh, at different points in the payment structure which eventually would lead to the changes and then distress uh, in the payment here is a photograph where like we do see lot of cracks just underneath the wheel paths right some over here lot of cracks and some uh, cracks over here and in between like we have like, less cracks which essentially is the case with uh, the fatty cracking in this like, way, like uh, i have a payment i want a vehicle to move and now uh, once i have like a uh, higher tensile stress at bottom of the payment that's under the asphaltic layer i do see like some micro cracks which would originate at bottom eventually that would propagate to top and then like i would see lot of cracks on surface right and now with that like we do see the uh, quality of the payment is going to deteriorate on the other hand like i can have a case where uh, due to excessive compressive stress on the payment i would see lot of undulations in the payment where say like uh, it might lead to lot of depressions on surface and that's going to lead to a uh, drop in the quality of the payment or, or service serviceability of the payment uh, function functionality as such so now this can happen in two ways like one is like basically like i have a really strong underlying material beat or uh, uh, wet mix macadam granular sub base and whatever but i have a really poor mixture like which i designed that's for asphaltic concrete or bituminous concrete and now over a period of time i would see like lot of compaction of this material and that's where like we do, i would see lot of undulations on surface this is what like we do refer to as like uh, a weak mixture like uh, which uh, which leads to rutting or it can be a case where like i have really good material on the surface that's the asphaltic concrete or bituminous concrete but the underlying material say like uh, whatever soil or granular subbase or uh, granular subgrade that's very poor so now what would happen with the same stress whatever is uh, applied on the pavement i would see like lot of compaction happening with the underlying material and then the top surface is just going to take this shape of the underlying material that's how like where like we would see undulations again on surface this is what we do refer to as rutting in fact like irc 37 like that's the payment design guidelines in uh, what we do use in india uh, we do use these two distress mechanisms to account for a uh, while designing the pavement right so now beat with fatigue or rutting or <laughs> uh, surface undulations which I, if i need to monitor first of all like i would take a condition survey which essentially would be like we like we would look at surface and then say okay like, what exactly is happening and then like we like or whether it's good or bad and then uh, uh, take up some maintenance activity or whatever required versus the evaluation survey like in fact that's going to be structural evaluation where uh, one would look at each and individual layer and how exactly it's performing and what are the modulus values so on or uh, like that so this is similar to where say like we uh, we have say some code and then we go to doctor and then they are uh, just looking at like and asking us like they would say okay you just have code and then like you take this medicine like you should be okay versus where say like they feel like there is something wrong and then they would go for say x-ray or uh, and what not and then they diagnose something else and then like we'll say oh, that's all oh, the corollary for this evaluation survey that's the structural evaluation so which would mean like basically if i had to take up the structural evaluation i do require a lot of time and people involved to uh, arrive at the conclusion however that's going to be mechanistic in nature in this like we'll like i would have access to each and every uh, material property i can use to make whatever inference versus in case of condition survey which is mostly based on visual observations or uh, it's mo mostly going to be empirical in nature which might not always give a uh, really good information required or uh, to take a, uh, take up any maintenance activity right uh, so now with that like we well, like uh, we do end up with this structural evaluation or uh, primarily uh, we do take up this structural evaluation to look at the health of the pavement in this like we well, like i need to know how exactly that this particular payment is performing after i open it for traffic 
whether like that's going to be sufficient for its design life in this like typically we would design the pavement for 15 to 20 years that's the asphaltic concrete pavement if we are looking at cement concrete pavement like we are looking at 30 years of design life now we construct it and then leave it there are a lot of issues which we really don't know while making predictions for future be it in terms of say uh, weather condition what are the traffic like what we are going to get or uh, over next 15 20 years so on we really don't have much information or, or control over it so now with that like we like we do explore, see like we like whatever we design that may not be up to mark in near future so then like we say like, uh, we are looking at okay like oh uh, we designed for something but in reality we are expecting something else so then like whether like the payment structure structure what we have now is it sufficient for the design life what we are looking at right so that's the part like where like we are looking at estimating the remaining service life of payment and now say we find okay like what we constructed uh, versus like what we do require for the design life which is just not sufficient which means like i need to go for some remedial measures which means like uh, most of the time like we go for overlay instead of like i put some new material put even as concrete on top of the existing material so that like i increase the payment cross section which in turn would give you uh, additional strength of in really vague terms or like basically the payment is going to take up uh, the additional traffic what we are going to have right so that's the purpose of uh, behind this structural evaluation and now if you look at the overall approach now if i have to monitor it uh, and look at like whether the payment is doing well or not i need to simulate condition what would happen exactly with the vehicular traffic i have in this like basic uh, just like way like we go to doctor and then like basic if they have to test us then they would try to simulate the uh, similar conditions where like uh, we would be having some allergy or whatever and then they look at those kind of particular issues so similarly like we where like we are going to simulate condition with say like whatever like the stress like we are going to have in the payment with say like say design vehicle that's the lorry we can simulate it and then measure the strain and deflection in this, like, that's going to be the, the response what we are going to have because i'm going to have a lorry which is going to be loaded with 10 12 ton or whatever load and once i take it to field and then like look at the sur response that's the surface deflection whatever i measure those things right or uh, that's how like we go about it in this like, well, like you know, if you look at the actual payment structure here is a case where like i have this field load wheel which is going to take load from uh, from the vehicle through the axle and now that's that load is going to be transmitted or uh, applied on the pavement through this yellow area that's the area of contact now i have this underlying material six you know, it can be four or five or even more number of layers what would happen like well like i have these individual layers each layer has its own or uh, modulus in case of elastic material like we use the term modulus of elasticity however in case of uh, payment engineering we don't use the term modulus of elasticity the reason is like, well, like uh, we do have the time dependency and rate dependency as well as temperature dependency coming into picture in this like if i take a case of uh, the dog bone specimen of metal what we do test in say strength of material slab probably in, uh, in second semester it's easy enough in this like, well, like i take 10 specimens apply the uh, do a displacement control test like we say i pull the specimen and then it's going to break i monitor the stress and strain and now i do this test at different strain or displacement uh, uh, rates it's like one i would test at say like one millimeter per minute other one say at 10 millimeter per minute so on so now most of the time like we do expect this stress strain curve with metal that steel or aluminium it's going to overlap however in case of bituminous material or this uh, the geologic materials say soil and aggregate we don't see that kind of response so with that like we uh, we normally don't use the term modulus of elasticity over here or uh, in broad terms like we, uh, i'm referring to that as modulus at this particular point that's say like we say es for surface for base material eb sub base esb so on and similarly i would know the poisons ratio of the material right and now uh, what are the as a designer like we would have used certain thickness i know the thickness of individual layer right i know the total load like what i am applying 
or the, uh, which in turn, like I can compute the stress which is being applied on the pavement surface. I know the modulus of individual modulus, modulus and Poisson's ratio and then thickness of individual layers, which in turn I can use to compute strain at different points, which in turn, like I can use that information to compute uh, the deflection on the surface, right? So now this is what we do refer to as structural analysis. Is, uh, in case of payment, which is pretty much straightforward when compared to uh, what we are going to see in a couple of slides now, right? So now, like if I need to compute whatever the stress and strain at different points uh, in, in a payment structure, one way is like, well, like we go for this instrumented payment. In this, like, while constructing the payment itself, I would embed a lot of load cells, transducers, LVDTs, so on. So primarily load cells to measure the stress, uh, transducers and uh, LVDTs to measure the strain at different uh, locations. Then uh, on top of it, like you put the asphaltic material and then you compact it, and then you have this data acquisition system which can capture like uh, whatever the stress, strain at different points in the pavement in whatever direction under the realistic load. Now, if I have to go for this particular approach, we are looking at like really lot of money which needs to be invested. And then like we need to mo monitor like the quality of these uh, electronic equipment for a really long time, which is going to be time as well as uh, expensive in, in terms of time or resources or, uh, or in terms of the labor involved. In that particular case, like the easiest way is like where like we go for uh, this non-destructive method one way is like we like uh, this Benkelman beam, which uh, most of the time like we do uh, have a lab component in undergraduate introduction to transportation course. What we do over here, like essentially we have a lorry uh, which is loaded, and uh, now I have this uh, beam sort of arrangement like which is pivoted at this particular point, and now I have this particular pointed end like which is just underneath the uh, two tires of the lorry. Now I lock the uh, beam at this particular point and make the vehicle to move forward. What would happen like when I have the, the vehicle standing and then like uh, this pivot like which is just underneath the uh, two wheels, I have like a lot of load which is coming on the pavement which in turn increases the stress which in turn uh, would, would lead to the higher response that's the uh, displacement is going to be on higher side. Once I move the vehicle forward, what would happen? The payment is going to rebound, which in turn like, is going to lead to decrease in the response. Here is a case where so, like, I have, uh, I'm monitoring like whatever the displacement at this particular point. When I have the vehicle just on top of it, I would see like a lot of deflection. Say like I'm locking the Benkelman beam at this particular point and I make the vehicle move forward and now the payment is going to rebound back. So now the whatever the deflection I'm going to have over here is going to be on lower side. So now the difference between these two is going to indicate uh, sort of strength of the payment. It's like, like to what extent the payment is going to rebound back. More rebound, which would mean like the payment is really good. And like if I just have like less rebound, which would be like I say payment is not performing as expected, right? So that's how like we, are, we would do uh, Benkelman beam uh, testing to find like the what are the uh, quality of the payment uh, most of the time. However, like, well, like, even though it sounds simple, we have certain issues over here. Let's go back and look at like uh, a simple test, like what we, uh, we just looked at. Instead of, well, like, I take a dog bone sample of metal, apply displacement control test, and then like measure stress and strain response. Let's say like, well, like I do the same test on asphalt concrete specimen. And now this is very, uh, Typical test like we like, uh, uh, will not be able to do on routine basis uh, because of various complications. Now, like uh, hypothetically, take this particular case where I make a specimen, cylindrical specimen of asphalt concrete or bituminous concrete, and then pull it down and measure its response. That's the stress, or vice versa. Where like I'm applying certain st uh, uh, stress and then like looking at like what are the response that is trying. So now, if I cross plot stress versus trying at a particular temperature. I'm keeping the temperature constant, like I make say three different specimens and test it at different 
strain rate in this like one can be a uh, really slow rate like say 0.1 mm per minute other one at 10 mm per, per minute so on so now the stress strain curve what we do get with different strain rate it's going to be different note that like in case of metal we are pretty much expecting or uh, we do see overlapping stress strain curve versus here like we say like, depending on this strain rate at which i am going to test the stress strain curve is going to be different the blue one over here that's at really low strain rate and the red one over here that's at really higher stress strain rate so now this is essentially is because of the time dependent response coming into picture and now well, i would expect significantly different stress strain curve over here and the other case can be where say like i'm doing the test at same strain rate but at say different temperature i make three specimens testing one specimen at 20 degrees celsius second one at 30 degrees celsius and third one at 40 degree or 50 degrees celsius so on so now if i test it at uh, and then monitor the stress strain response this is how it looks like in this like at really low temperature 10 degree whatever it's going to be brittle and the specimen is going to take more load or more stress but it's going to fail at lower strain level versus in case of higher temperature the peak stress which it's going to take that's the failure stress it's going to be on lower side when compared to the temperature t1 but it can take more strain before it actually fails and beyond that also like i am going to see like a lot of um, deviation as such so which would mean if i uh, if i am looking at the stress strain curve which is going to be dependent on rate depend uh, dependent on rate as well as temperature now if i translate these two uh, fundamental diagrams that stress and strain curve into a realistic payment what would happen here is a case where i have the uh, asphaltic layer and then the underlying material i am just monitoring whatever the strain at this particular point this is similar to whatever like we did in uh, structural analysis that's the influence diagram diagram where i am looking at stress or strain at a particular point when a uh, load is moving right so now if i take that particular concept over here we like uh, have this car which is moving from left to right i am monitoring what are this response that's this uh, strain at this particular point right so now when i have this vehicle like which is far away that's over here we can say like at oh, negative 2 meter over here i'm not going to have any effect on this particular location so which would be in this strain at this particular point is going to be zero and now once i have the car which is just above this particular point i'm going to have maximum stress which in turn is going to lead to maximum strain uh, with that like i'm going to have this peak value and now once i have this car which is moving forward and when it once it moves out towards 3 meters beyond the point of interest the strain is go again going back to zero approximately so now that's all like way like i would see like uh, the curve like the vertical strain the curve is going to be something like this but now on the other hand like where like if i do this particular test at different car speed 2 km 2 km per hour 20 km per hour and 200 km per hour i'm going to see significantly different strain versus offset distance response the same is seen over here in this like like if i'm doing a uh, or if i'm traveling at 2 km per hour i'm going to have like more deflection or more strain versus in case of 200 km per hour i'm going to have like less deflection this is primarily because of the elastic effect or viscoelastic effect of the asphaltic concrete or uh, and that's how like i'm going to see this difference so now if i have this particular concept to this benkelman beam what would happen is in this like, like the speed at which i am going to move the lorry forward is going to make lot of difference when it comes to what are the dis displacement i am going to have right we say like, a heavy vehicle or lorry which is static i move say 20 meter 20 meter from that particular point whether i am going to move at really low speed 1 km per hour or instantaneously said 50 km per hour that's going to make lot of difference and then with that like with what are the deflection i'm going to have that's the final deflection that's going to be different right so we should mean like we say or uh, whatever the strength or like the health which i'm going to monitor is going to be affected by the 
speed of the lorry which i'm going to use right at the same time like the other issue would come up is like in this like, like here is a case i am seeing like same amount of deflection with two different payment configuration say this this is the configuration one i have same deflection but the underneath layers are the, uh, the thickness of under the underlying image layers are different in case of say the, uh, this case two where like i have same deflection but the underlying layers are configurations are completely different right so which would mean like basically without having details about the underlying layers what we do in case of bankel main beam i can have say same deflection measurement which would indicate like the both the payments are exactly same but in reality we say the, the uh, just because of the payment, uh, payment configuration which is completely different the response or the health of payment can be completely different and in fact will be different right so now this is an issue with benkelman beam method like what we do use which needs to be accounted like uh, in reality right at the same time like we have the issues or uh, other issues are like in in terms of say dbm dense bituminous macadam or bituminous layers what are the contribution which we are going to have benkelman beam actually underestimates those values right and then uh, we are just looking at two measurements at this particular point in case of benkelman beam that's the initial measurement and then final measurement that's it right but the way in which like the the rebound is going to happen that's actually indicated by this deflection ball which is just not accounted uh, which would mean like, well, like we are actually losing some additional information which possibly is available which can be used right and then like uh, typically this is what benkelman like, we are looking at the static load condition which actually does not represent or indicate what would happen in case of five ways right so in case of five ways like we like we are looking at 60 70 km speed most of the time which in turn like is going to lead to a uh, more elastic response of the payment as well as like here like with benkelman beam like we are looking at like the really uh, uh, labor intensive process as well as time intensive process like we are looking at heavily loaded lorry which needs to be brought to site and then like uh, or uh, at least a uh, half a dozen of people uh, and then you imagine the time or uh, time required that's where essentially this falling wake deflectometer like in, in terms of not non destructive evaluation comes into picture here is a case like, well, like what we do with falling wake deflectometer is we have a, a certain weight which is going to fall from certain height and once it falls from certain height like well, like we have the known mass moving through a certain distance which in turn is going to, uh, going to give you a certain amount of energy which is going to be applied on the payment surface that's through the spring and then the loading plate and now what would happen like once i allow this weight to fall on the payment there is going to be some deflection which i need i am going to monitor and then uh, this monitoring of the, the deflection is going to be through different uh, a series of sensors where like i would have typically 6 to 8 sensors which are at certain offsets right so now here is a case like where say like whatever the load which is going to be applied that's going to be over 300 millimeter area and then like whatever the load that's typically 40 kiloton load which mostly similar uh, is similar to the load which we are expecting in case of typical lorry right and now here is a case like where like uh, this deflect uh, here is the load plate and whatever load which is coming that's from the top and here are six different sensors which are used to monitor the deflection right so what would happen like well like i know the weight which is falling from certain height which in turn like, would give me the stress and then like here like i have the deflection which is measured through the uh, the uh, lvdts which in turn would give me uh, the response right here is a case like well like if i'm looking at like uh, i apply the load I allow the uh, load to fall and then like I monitor the response of the payment at different uh, locations. Typically it would look like say, once I apply the load, the response or like there's going to be a lot of deflection and then it's going to move back. This is at a particular location, right? And now as I have the certain offset, more offset where the uh, applied stress or the stress experience at that particular point is going to be on lower side which in turn is going to reduce the deflection, right? And there's going to be offset in terms of time as well. That's the reason like you see like, well, like just underneath the load, 
you are going to see maximum deflection and which is going to happen pretty quickly versus where like I have the, the uh, what are the offset which is on the higher side the deflect total deflection is also on lower side as well as the maximum deflection which is going to happen in terms of time is also going to be more right so now in with this particular test like where like what we are getting with like we have the load whatever is being applied and then like what are this deflection of this payment over period of time so now i can use this measurement to get the deflection ball in this like, like uh, typically we go with say 0 millimeter until 1.5 millimeter or uh, 1.5 meter that's the 1500 millimeter right so that's the offset like we are looking at and which in turn would give me the deflection ball in like where i have the deflection at different locations at different offsets which in turn uh, can indicate the structural health of the pavement now if you look at uh, the various deflectometers like with indian uh, context the first one was actually fabricated by it karakpur back in 2000 uh, uh, during r81 project here is the version like uh, the initial version which they had later like uh, the second uh, version was something like this like where uh, that was actually housed within the metador and then like they used to take it to site and now the recent one like is the uh, that's the third generation one like which is mostly like uh, on the trailer mounted one like and which which can do the testing and now if we are looking at the abroad like where like we have a couple of them mostly from europe and us kub fwd model as well as dynatest like this is from uh, us essentially like uh, all these equipments work on the same principle like where like i have a load like which is falling from certain height i apply the load and then like monitor the deflection which in turn uh, can be used to monitor the health of the payment and now uh, if you look at uh, the agency like what uh, who have this equipment like where cri cme pune and it karakpur have it and uh, off late like certain uh, private organizations in india like also have it and now most of the testing uh, what we have done like which covers like the entire spectrum say be it with uh, starting with village roads until national highways cement concrete payment bituminous payment you name it uh, pretty much like, well, like we do have experience with all kinds of payment and then configuration so on now the process like uh, non destructive evaluation would be like basically like, first like we would go with you know, condition survey in this like, well, like whether like we have to do this survey or not that's going to be something like uh, which would be taken up with the visual survey and go to site and then look at it like uh, and then use falling weight deflectometer to get the measurement and then back calculate the properties in this like, like i have the response of the payment i know the load now i need to calculate the modulus value and now based on that like where i can estimate like how uh, what is the remaining life of payment and if, if i had to take up any overlay at this particular point what should be the case that's in the fifth step right so first step would be where like uh, where we would start at office level where like uh, we would start with what are the design like what we did at the initial stage Traffic data, what we have, and then like during construction, what are the quality control data like we have collected, and if possible, like well, if any maintenance activity has been taken up, those kind of details. Mostly, like quick, uh, best would be say talking to engineer like, who actually worked on that particular payments or uh, that particular section, that uh, would give most of the additional information which might not be reflected in the actual documentation, and then go for site and look at these sections like uh, so. And then, like we can have this uniform so sections or homogeneous sections. Then we would do this distress mapping. This is basic. Whatever may be the payment structure, what 20, 30, whatever kilometer length, you classify that into three broad categories: good, fair, poor, so on. So that, like, then, like you can take up the additional surveys. And now, with that, like what uh, this indication is, like these three categories: good, fair, or poor. That would indicate, like, at what spacing I need to do. The non-destructive evaluation that's the uh, using falling weight deflectometer. Fundamentally, like uh, we are going with say, like if we have like more scatter, we need to uh, take more number of samples, which in turn is going to reduce the spacing, right? And that's how like we just go about it. And now, in case of falling weight deflectometer, like what we are looking at, like as uh, we did discussed previously, like we are looking at around 300 millimeter plate, and then around. Um, uh 350 to 550 to 350 normal cases uh, of course in case of airport payment it can go up to 1000 kg uh, load as well 
and now we apply that load uh, to impact uh, mechanism on the pavement and then this load has to be applied within duration of 15 to my, uh, 15 to 50 microsecond right and then uh, we get the data first and foremost like since like we are actually relying on load cell and then uh, LBDTs, we need to calibrate both on routine basis. In fact, IRC does recommend like uh, both needs to be calibrated on yearly basis uh, or like if it is being used on uh, uh, more, if it is being used more frequently, uh, we need to reduce the, uh, uh, the calibration time as well, right? And now, uh, since like we do require information regarding the thickness of payment, one way is to go with this test pit, which means like, well, I actually, I would go, go to site, dig it, and then like measure the thickness of individual layers using this, uh, using a scale, or it can be using say cores. In this way, like, uh, I take this drill bit and then uh, cut a core and take it out and then look at the, uh, take measurements using the core. And then like, that's how like, I would get the uh, layer, uh, layer thickness, or it can be with say the, uh, dynamic cone parameter test test, uh, which is sort of non-invasive uh, to certain extent, or completely non-invasive would be with the uh, ground penetrating radar, and that's how like I can get the individual layer thickness. So now what would happen? Like, well, like I have measurements uh, regarding uh, the deflection at different locations, that's the offset distance, uh, and which using which like I can compute the uh, what are the material properties now. Uh, I feel like we are looking at a standard temperature, like we are looking at 35 degrees Celsius, that's the standard temperature. And now like, well, like any deviation, like uh, which usually happens due to seasonal variation, here's the equation like uh, recommended by IRC, which uh, using which like I, we can normalize at 35 degrees Celsius, right? What would happen like in reality, like uh, if I'm looking at a particular payment over a period of time, this is within a year, I would see cyclic variation in temperature which in turn would lead, uh, as well as like uh, we would see like cyclic variation in moisture content, which in turn would lead to cyclic variation in modulus values of the individual layers. Be it with subgrade modulus or uh, grander subbase or asphaltic concrete, we would see cyclic variation in the material properties or the modulus value, right? So now that brings the issue over here, like, like, like with the uh, falling weight deflectometer, I'm getting measurements at def uh, the surface deflection at different locations, I have thickness of individual layers, right? Now I need to compute modulus as well as Poisson's ratio. Most of the time, like we do see Poisson's ratio is sort of you know, insensitive to the payment response. So uh, we normally take reasonable value over here, for, uh, mostly in the range of 0.3 to 0.35, which should be okay for most of the payment cross sections. So the only sensitive variable remaining at this particular point would be this modulus values. That's E subscript, yes, B or whatever, right? So now in case of forward calculation, like it's pretty much straightforward. Like I know the load which is being applied. That's the stress on surface. I know the modulus values, Poisson's ratio and thickness. I, need, I can compute deflection or strain. On the other hand, like if I'm looking at a typical for FWD test, it's the other way, like I have the information regarding deflection and then the load, but I just don't know the modulus values, which I need to calculate. So that's where essentially we go with this back calculation process. In this like, like I would start with say some modulus value, assume certain modulus value, and then do the typical analysis or the payment analysis, and then get the response. That's the deflection. And then compare whatever like I observed in field, if both are comparable, I'm okay with that. Or if they are not comparable, then I would go and change the modulus values and then repeat this exercise a uh, sufficient number of time until I get reasonable accuracy, right? So basically this is a problem of, uh, of optimization. In this like, like, I have same deflection, but I can have really large number of solutions for this particular uh, modulus value. So which is normally referred to as inverse problem, uh, with this, like we end up with, it's not a unique solution as such. There are a couple of approaches where like beat with closed form solution or database search, uh, but it has its own limitation. Uh, with that, like we normally go with optimization process uh, where like say like uh, it, it would take slightly more time, but it would give uh, really good results, right? 
and that's essentially the case in case of uh, whatever the uh, algorithm developed uh, from IIT Kharagpur back in 2000. Well, like we would start with the uh, problem assignment things like well, like I know the initial or uh, whatever the approximate modulus values of individual layers. I use that to calculate further like uh, whatever the response that's the deflection, and then I compare with whatever the response I get from this field. And look at say whatever the mean square error or whatever, then like uh, that's going to be the value or, or like the optimization uh, objective function for us. And now, if I have like really good accuracy, if I have really good uh, estimate of the modulus value which I'm using, I'm okay with it. If not, like I need to change the modulus values and repeat this exercise multiple times. So now, how do we change the modulus values? In this, like, like if I go with manual approach, it's going to be really time consuming and then like, like we really have like infinite number of solution or uh, reasonable answers available to us. So that's the case like where like we go with this genetic algorithm process. In this like, like here is a case like say with whatever the more deflection I have, like I can have say like say 1200 for bituminous concrete, 200 for GSP and under uh, subgrade 50 MPA, whatever. And the other case can be based like 1375. All both the options are good enough, but there might be an even better solution available which we really don't know. So what we do over here like, is like we, like we pick some part from individual solution, combine it together, and then check whether it's good or not. If this is good enough, we are going. To, if this is better than the previous two, we are going to use this uh, the new one. If this is really poor, then like we just uh, use the previous solution, so on. But now we say like, it can be a case where like, I might end up with say, like, uh, some arbitrary change which possibly can give really good results. That's the case over here. Like, like uh, I have this 1000 MPA, 250 MPA, which is changed to 1350. Possibly it's going to give a better result. So now that's how like, like actually like, humans evolved over a period of time. That's the survival of fittest, which are gives the better or uh, who has uh, more strength, like they sustain like uh, with poor genes, like they uh, died, so on, right? So similarly over here, like, like whichever gives the better accuracy we are going to use it further and then go on repeating this exercise until like i hit the better solution and now here is a case like where uh, if i'm going with this optimization approach i it can be a case where like i have like multiple solutions available all are good enough how do i choose one particular value in that particular case like we what we normally go is like we, like, we have a pool of all feasible solutions and with that, like we pick the 85th percentile modulus. In this, like, like no, we acknowledge that okay, there is going to be scatter in the data. Like what we are looking at, use that measurement to uh, arrive at uh, statistically reasonable value. And that's how like we go about it, right? Once I have this modulus value for individual layer, which are good enough, then like uh, we are going with overlay design. In this, like, like I need to put some additional material on top. How do I measure it? So now I know the modulus value of individual layers, then I do the, the forward calculation, say like, like I know the total load which is being applied, I know the modulus value, Poisson ratio, so on, and now you look at the tensile, uh, critical tensile stress and critical vertical compressive strain over here. T uh, tensile strain, that's going to be critical at these two locations uh, in the bituminous concrete layer, that's the surface course, versus uh, vertical compressive strain, that's going to be Critical at these two locations indicated by these two blue dots that's on top of subgrade. So now, based on these two locations, like you know uh, what is the strain you are actually getting, and now you can go ahead and you, uh, compute the number of repetitions which are allowed. This like we beat for fatigue or rating. You have these two equations readily available in IRC 37, which can be used to get uh, the allowable number of repetitions for future. Now we find like which is not good enough, which means like I need to put additional layer of material. So that's the process with uh, overlay thickness. So that's the case over here, like what we do uh, in case of typical analysis, I have these three layers now, I need to put additional layer of asphaltic concrete for which I know the modulus value or like I can assume a reasonable number. So now with that, like, well, like I do this payment analysis to get the critical tensile strain and uh, critical vertical compressive strain on top of subgrade. So now you get these two measurements 
and now once it's once you have a reasonable number or whatever uh, which is okay enough which should be okay so now to get that particular or uh, whatever value like allowable number of refreshes i need to have information regarding the traffic which is expected in near future which means like we like i need to do a survey for 7 days 24 7 that's the classified count uh, and then you make predictions for future if that is just not possible like irc does allow you uh, want to use 5% growth rate like uh, which is reasonable enough for most of the payment like what to do in counter so now i have the projection for future like how many repetitions i am expecting in next uh, in next one or two years or 10 years or whatever and now based on like whatever the analysis like i get like how many repetitions i am getting and that's how like i can get the overlay thickness right so that's how like we go about this of uh, forward back calculation using falling weight diffractometer and then to design the overlay thickness of course like with overlay thickness this is really at conceptual level or uh, we do have this irc code uh, which gives in detail information the step by step process to be used right uh, so with that like i would uh, probably i'm exceeding my time please stop at this particular point. and if you have any questions like uh, feel free to uh, ask like i would be happy to answer Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your insightful talk on uh, non-destructive evaluation of payment. Uh, I would like to ask the participants to, if you have any questions, uh, you can uh, ask the speaker directly. One by one, you can ask the questions. Arvind, sir, I have a few. I have, okay, okay, ma'am, you can go ahead. Uh, hello, sir. Good evening. myself uh, amruta lakade uh, i am a phd candidate and my research topic is composite payment uh, uh -huh. i just uh, want to know ki if I, if i go for uh, if i design a composite payment and for its evaluation which instrument or which technique or which method i should prefer for its evaluation oh uh, in this like like uh, in case of composite payment like you have couple of issues like where like you have a uh, bituminous material on top or cement concrete on top uh, so with that like, is com com uh, no, so mine is, uh, i'm over i'm overlaying flexible concrete a flexible layer on a rigid layer flexible layer on a rigid layer so now with that like basically like, uh, yes. uh, i uh, uh, first of all like, like uh, we need to know the underlying material properties in this like, like if it is cement concrete like whether like uh, that has been crushed completely or not that's going to affect uh, your payment response is like one is like uh, we go for uh, complete pulverization and then go for overlay so then like we like uh, possibly like uh, fwd is going to work better is going to be reasonable so, versus like in case of so like you are not going to crush the underlying concrete payment you, ju you are just going for overlay on top of it so then like we, this particular approach is not going to give you better result or uh, possibly like in that particular case like uh, maybe a combination of destructive and non destructive evaluation it's going to help you or uh, uh, to a large extent okay thank you sir thank yeah. you a lot uh, anybody uh, anybody else uh, participants have questions please uh, can go ahead hello sir yeah. i am uh, sivir amart uh, retired security detail from pwd uh, Just uh, I want to one question, sir. Ask. Whatever the deflections uh, uh, test have been carried out, they are depending on the standard engine wheel. That is yes. about eight tons to rear uh -huh. engine wheel. But in practice, actually, the commercial vehicles are overloading. Yeah. So we were met with the standard engine load, and in practice, uh, the actually the heavy the more load is being applied by the engines. Then mm -hmm. there will be difference in the deflection. Any adjustability is being done in the evaluation for overloading. Uh, if I understand your question correctly, like uh, you uh, have, uh, we have this whole thing. Understand your question correctly. Now, that right? So, uh, now, in case of FWD uh, approach for uh, overloaded payment cross section, one thing is like, like uh, most of these FWDs they have the option to increase the load which. or uh, the hammer load which we have got to so uh, that could help us to simulate like what happened in case of the overloaded tracks
Uh, similarly, a uh, Dana test has the top option. Like we said, we can change the this duration as well. So now changing the amplitude of the load which we are going to apply as well as the uh, duration, we can see what would happen in case of real uh, or red trucks to certain extent. Uh, yes, any any other participants? Sir, I have a few questions uh, in the chat box. Let me put them. Uh, one question is, what are the current problems or challenges uh, that we are facing in the payment engineering? Oh, uh, uh, current challenges like, uh, 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 one is like, like uh, at this particular point, possibly like I would distinguish in terms of select like, as an academician or practicing engineer. So if you look at like our guidelines, like payment design guidelines, like which uh, which we are in mechanistic empirical approach to certain extent, this is something what Western countries adopted 30, 40 years back. Or even we say like if you're looking at asphaltic uh, bitumen, bitumen uh, specifications, which we changed like in 2006 and reversed in 2013, like which uh, Western 40 years back. So now those are certain issues like which we need to address. That's a challenge for us uh, with Indian context, like, like our specifications and then the approach what we are using is actually outdated. Uh, that's one aspect. The other one is like uh, with respect to say like whatever data like we do require in this like, like if you are looking at this MEPDG, mechanistic empirical payment design, that does require like, say, like some transfer functions like which would relate like what are the strains or strain like I do expect at laboratory condition and relating the two seat side condition, that's a field condition. So now for that field condition, like we like which would happen over 40, 30, at least 15, 20 years in case of flexible payment, I need to have that kind of data which is collected on routine basis. In fact, like be it Europe or US, they do collect data with most of their highway infrastructure on monthly basis. Or there are certain DOTs where they do collect data on a uh, daily basis. As well as say certain uh, sections like, like uh, that's the NCAT test track back in US, where like they do construct payment cross sections and then like have this accelerated payment testing, like they, they do kind of do have these lorries which are just roaming 24-7. What happens site in 20 years, that's they are going to simulate that in say five years and then monitor that. So those kind of issues like we are actually lacking, like uh, especially with Indian contact, like we really don't have that kind of database like which gives that information which can be used to translate that to payment guidelines uh, at this particular point. So that's something like where, uh, which is uh, actually lacking for us. And now, uh, uh, of course, like, uh, if you look from field perspective, the kind of testing like what we are looking at, which actually would simulate realistic field conditions, most of our testing practice, it's actually outdated. Like, uh, so that's one of the challenges like where like, possibly where, like, we have to update our uh, specifications and guidelines as well. Uh, <coughs> Professor Arvind? Yeah, yeah sir. Am I audible? Yeah. Uh, I am uh, I am proud to be an alumni of uh, NIA. And uh, in fact, I heard through the lecture. It was ah, excellent. Uh, I am the vice principal of uh, Vidya Vikas Institute of Engineering and Technology, Mysore. I have guided around eight uh, uh, students, and uh, two are being guided in the same area. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, in India being the, the developing country, I feel, particularly the payment design, uh, we need to look for uh, local solutions wherein uh, it has to be economical and uh, maybe uh, feasible solutions, uh, particularly in urban area. Because uh, in India, I think uh, more than 70% uh, uh, we live in, uh, uh, I mean, rural India, r rural areas, and uh, there uh, the payment, um, of course, you know the conditions. There we need to do something wherein we, uh, by using the locally available materials, we should be able to uh, uh, rather strengthen and uh, stabilize, consolidate those uh, areas. Yeah. In fact, like, if you look at like uh, uh, we say soil stabilization or say like uh, with traditional payment uh, cross sections, what we do use, uh, possibly the, the equipment and then the testing practice which we are looking at, like they would cost like uh, 
couple of crores. And it's like if you are, if you are typically looking at national highway, like for each say, oh, say like 40, 50 kilometer stretch, like we can just assume okay, like we just didn't construct one kilometer stretch, and then like possibly we can update some of the testing uh, or the equipments over there. As well as like you are right, like in terms of stabilization, like there are several efforts like, which are going on. But uh, unfortunately, like, well, like all these stabilization techniques, like they are specific to the soil type. In this, like, the chemical composition of soil, which is available locally, that's going to affect the deterioration properties significantly. So that's one of the area, like, where like, uh, uh, you know, IRC is working on those issues to, uh, to come up with specifications. But mostly, like, we are borrowing from abroad, even at this particular point. Uh, so that's where we just need to address those issues. Thank you, sir. Uh, any other participants uh, who are having any questions? Uh, 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 hello, sir. Professor Arvind, this is ah, Sidramappa. Ah, sir. Uh, sir, so you, uh, your presentation was nice. Uh, you have almost told with respect to the flexible payments. Ah, so the same kind of uh, the test can be done for uh, concrete, that is uh, rigid pavements. Ah, are the different methods are there? Uh, FWD has been adopted for rigid payment as well, but uh, the issue with the FWD as applied to cement concrete would come like in this like, like if I'm looking at interior of slab, uh, we are not going to get any deflection. So yeah. now uh, that's going to be a drawback with this particular approach in this like, like if I'm looking at the magnitude of load, what uh, we, which is being applied through FWD versus the strength or modulus of cement concrete, the difference is too much. So now with that, like we like of uh, interior of uh, a issue. However, in case of joints, like we say, a big transverse joint or longitudinal joint, to look at the efficiency of those joints, uh, FWD can be used. In this, like, like uh, that being the sort of like, say, like very uh, weak point, or like basically, we can expect like more uh, deflection over there, like this, this can work. Uh, in the sense, uh, are is there any other methods are there? Uh, other techniques would be like, in this, like, like typically, with in case of cement concrete like, like uh, if we have like really micro cracks this uh, rebound hammer technique and those kind of uh, techniques yeah, well. yeah. Uh, 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 which uh, right, whatever we are using for the ndt for this uh, yeah. regular uh, structures like, we use for uh, buildings like it should work yeah. for here as well unless like we like, we uh, have uh, we just don't have too many cracks in the pavement okay 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 but okay, uh, for joint if you, uh, efficiency like uh, fwd can be used but uh, is there any change in the uh, weight of the that uh, particular uh, this we one? We need to change the load as well as the pulse duration. Okay. Uh, so in the sense, uh, uh, there is a separate procedure itself. Or the procedure may be the same. No procedure. So the falling the weight, falling weight, uh -huh. and the height. Everything we are supposed to be change it, or is it as uh, same as uh, flexible? Uh, in case of uh, uh, because like we typically looking at like reasonable deflection which we can get which could should be captured so which means like okay. if i'm looking at cement or uh, bituminous material like, like it, it would deflect more versus cement quantity it's going to deflect less for same load so now to have that like uh, accuracy like uh, so i am looking at like reasonable deflection which should mean like i would have to increase the load of the fwd as well as to change the or uh, uh, pulse duration as well, which in turn like, can be changed through the height of fall as well, which is the approach like which they use in case of uh, airport payment. Okay. okay uh, because okay. like say, over there, like the load which we are expecting is on higher side, and then the aircrafts like which typically move at 250 km speed uh, at touchdown uh, uh, location. So now to account for those issues, like uh, we normally go for higher load as well as like say like higher falling uh, high test. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, sir, we have uh, uh, one more question here. Uh, what is the difference between uh, ultrasound and ultrasonic wave prop propagation in elastic and viscoelastic materials, uh, like concrete versus bitumen mixtures? So now that's the case, like uh, ultrasonic uh, propagation, that's where like, uh, we are looking at like uh, really high frequency waves, um, if I remember correctly. So now in case of elastic material, like we say, like, that's where like, like we have stress versus strain response that's going to be linear. Or even if it is non-linear, basically like if I'm applying some cyclic load, I get the loading and unloading curve, which are going to overlap. 
However, in case of viscoelastic material, where like uh, depending on the loading path or unloading path, the stress versus strain response is going to be different. Right. So now that's the case like with viscoelastic material. Uh, typically, in case of uh, any wave propagation technique, uh, with viscoelastic material, like we, like we do see a lot of attenuation. In this case, like lot of energy or what are the waves which are going, which are supposed to be propagated, they are going to be dissipated. Versus in case of elastic material, like all the energy is going to be transmitted. In this case, the whatever like uh, energy which I am supplying. What is going to be lost is going to be on lower side in case of elastic material versus in case of viscoelastic material, uh, we are going to lose a lot of energy through dissipation. So that's a challenge in case of viscoelastic material, like we say ultrasonic uh, waves uh, approach is not going to work because most of the energy that's going to be dissipated through this vitamin itself or the fluid media, uh, media in between. Okay, sir. Okay. Uh, any other participants uh, will quickly wind up this. Uh... So we are getting some more questions. Uh, I, I, could, I will just uh, take them and I will mail you, sir, so that uh, it can be uh, forwarded to. Uh, yes, 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 sir. sir uh, okay, uh, sir, I would like to ask uh, principal sir to few uh, speak few words uh, regarding this. So please. Professor uh, Arvind Krishna Swami, an eminent professor at IIT Delhi, who is uh, uh, from Karnataka. We are proud of you, sir. Uh, respected senior faculties of the various colleges, learned colleagues from SCBIT, dear student friends, and all the dear participants across India. In fact, uh, Dr. Arvind has uh, nicely presented about the non-destructive evaluation of the pavement. Uh, in fact, I spent some time at IIT Delhi. I came to know about that one. So he was a very enthusiastic and having a zeal uh, to do a lot many things. He was coordinating one FDP. I was attending there. So about in a week. This is how I came in contact with uh, Dr. Arvind at IIT Delhi. Uh, uh, dear friends, the most important part in any of the evaluation is to find out the deflection. That is what he was saying during uh, the FDP also. So once the deflection, in the sense we are supposed to be understand the stress strain curve of the different materials, whatever we are using for the construction. It may be a pavement or it may be any kind of a civil structure or any structure for that matter. So therefore, so uh, here also he has presented very nicely with respect to that how we are supposed to be get the strength stress strain curve. So for the different temperature, that is the constant temperature with the different uh, uh, in those strain loading and all that kind of things he has covered, and also how we are supposed to be maintain it. And uh, instead of just going that it depends upon the deteriorations and the conditions. So all those kind things kinds of things are very important. The one more point he has uh, touched upon is. Uh, so as uh, Professor Shesh Prakash has asked for that one, so with the rural segments or the different kinds of uh, the local solutions and all. So the rightly told by uh, Dr. Arvind is, uh, so that is a subsurface. So the chemical composition of the subsurface also matters a lot. So if the pavements of the roads laid on uh, some, uh, you know, the uh, salty areas, or it may be a black cotton soil, or it may be of any kind of, uh, uh, saline affected, uh, uh, you know, salinity, what we can call. So that is uh, the lot of moisture and the saline has come from the ground. So then uh, what kind of things we are supposed to be looking into it. So these are the where the civil engineers are supposed to be looking into it. This is an eye opener so that we, even though, even though it is a, uh, that is what so I was saying to many of the people. So the uh, civil engineering is uh, seems to be too old, but a uh, lot many problems are still open to do many things. So that we are supposed to be addressed. So nowadays, so it can be easily done because of the digital technology. We are supposed to be used all these uh, advanced uh, things for the testing. Once if the testing so that it is a database, the database is correct. So definitely the analysis will become 
the uh, uh, you know the uh, you know the correct so the decisions will be correct so this is how uh, he has explained about the ventral beam and also the uh, falling weight uh, deflectometer uh, uh, for the flexible pavements and uh, nicely represented with the uh, all the graphs figures everything and it was very nice sir so even you have uh, uh, told that one so why you are not going to call that one a, a model as a plasticity so it is not like uh, the tensile test what we are conducting at uh, uh, second semester or third semester strength of materials so it is not uh, uh, the same as that so that is why so he is using only the young's modulus that is a e so that is also the nice so therefore we being an engineers we are supposed to be look at uh, the properties of the materials basically so then the deflection because if the deflection knows we can calculate anything and then the design can be done and also he touched upon the irc 37 and also how exactly the modern uh, things are coming up even in the europe or us and uh, the, with the context of the uh, india so i hope that one is so in near future the most of the people will going to be think my at micro level so at the micro level so if the people are just thinking all the civil engineers i think uh, the modern civil engineering going to evolve i think it is already there at uh, different places but this is what i am looking at uh, the district levels and the common colleges the people have supposed to be the especially the teachers especially the teachers i being the principal usually i am saying so first you find out the stress strength curve of all the materials so that itself is a big challenge so then if the equipment and the interest are going in that way so definitely it will be much uh, uh, better things will be there sir nice presentation you have covered uh, beautifully with uh, uh, good graphs and uh, technically very sound so with this note so i really appreciate your uh, the time because i just spoke to you and you you, you just uh, uh, you know uh, sent a message to me so when i requested you so and also it was uh, earlier uh, uh, thought that one to keep it on saturday because yesterday was a uh, our second ia then i thought that one it can be reached to the students community so therefore we have postponed it so you have made that one so on sunday also of course it is a lockdown period but at iit as you told that one so the phd students and the mtech online are going on so uh, even though at uh, this point of time you have given your time sir so we are looking forward the same cooperation in future too i'll be in touch with you sir thank you thank you uh, professor arvin so over to deepak now uh, thank you sir thank you very much uh, uh, i would uh, end up wind up this uh, webinar by thanking first the speaker for this insightful talk on uh, non district evaluation of uh, payment materials thank you very much sir thank you very much arvin sir uh and i would like to thank our uh, beloved principal uh, dr sidram appa it sir uh, for motivating it uh, motivating us to conduct these type of webinars and i would also like to thank our hod dr patakundi sir and uh, finally uh, last but not the least i would like to thank all the participants who uh, actively attended in this webinar we'll be having some more webinars in the upcoming uh, uh, future and we'll be in touch with you for all those things uh, thank you thank you everyone thank you thank you sir and uh, uh, for participants uh, i think uh, we are also doing it with this uh, uh, the one more webinar on friday that is fifth so with the iii local center on environmental day where is that one so the jc professor dr lokesh will going to uh, address this is just for the information to the uh, audience dr uh, arvind krishna swami yeah one minute sir uh, can we get the e certificates yeah, yeah, yes sir yes yes sir we have already sent the feedback to link you can just put there i have i, I have i have done it thank you yes thank you sir thank you sir thank you all the participants i once again thank thank you arvin sir professor arvin 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 ah, swami see you again okay see you sir thank you sir thank, thank you sir. thanks thank you. thank you very much uh, with permission of